Ladies and gentlemen, it's time now for our plenary debate. It's United in Solidarity, Defending Western Democracy. This debate, and, and indeed our entire EPP Congress, takes place in the context of democracies being tested more than at any time for many decades. And yes, we have, we have seen how powerful our unity can be. We have come together as the EPP family to reaffirm our democratic values in a time of war and to stand with Ukraine. Our values are not just abstract principles, but they are embodied in the lives and in the stories of individual human beings. Here to introduce our speakers is our debate moderator, the Secretary General of the European, European People's Party. Here is Antonio Lopez Esturiz. Don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you very much. And uh, it's my first intervention today, and uh, I would like to, to tell how, as you know, how happy I am to be in the Netherlands and to be with all of you, with my friends of the CDA. It is, uh, friends, a pleasure now to introduce the speakers for this panel that we are going to discuss. I require your attention because the quality of the speakers, I believe you will understand, merits this. First of all, I have to tell you that the Prime Minister of Greece, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, and the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister of Croatia, Andrei Plenković, uh, are on their way. They will arrive in 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we are a little bit, people, we are a little bit on advance, so we have to, uh, we have to also wait a little bit uh, for them. But nevertheless, we will start, and it is my pleasure to introduce two young, known by all of you, leaders of the EPP. Will or will not. One of them is a dear friend that uh, I have known for many years when she started in our youth organization in the EPP. And today she is the proud vice president of the EPP and president of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola. And also, from the Netherlands, our good friend and Minister of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Prime Minister of the Government of this country, Wopke Hoogstra. <laughs> so, the uh, title of today's main plenary debate it's defending Western democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, you know we are under siege, both from outside our frontiers and from inside. Putin, Erdogan, and many others are trying to erode the democratic principles of this European Union by all means. And inside the European Union, we have populists and extremes, right and left, that are trying also to destroy our European dream. We have heard today friends, colleagues, brothers and sisters from Belarus. There are also from Georgia, from Moldova, from many places that they are giving their fight to have the same rights and freedoms that we have here in Europe. We cannot give this for granted. These friends are sharing with us, and I will ask you during this Congress to listen to them. You have also uh, debates around this uh, plenary session where they are speaking, they are telling their what is happening with them, the sufferance, the persecution that they are suffering, and also, of course, our Ukrainian friends, that they will have their moment yeah. later on. 
Roberta, you were the first president of a parliament that was present in Kiev. Please tell us, how was, what did you find? What was your first impression? Please share with us your personal thoughts, those moments. Let's today not talk, not talk so much about policies, but about human sentiments. What were your feelings when you arrived to Kiev? Uh, thinking that I have been attending EPP Congresses for 20 years uh, and I'm uh, very, very happy uh, to be here today uh, in my capacity as President of the European Parliament with so many uh, dear colleagues and friends. The decision to, to go to, to Ukraine on the 1st of April, so exactly two months ago from today, was one uh, that I took after I was invited by our colleagues from the European Parliament but also after the European Parliament had decided, and we were the first parliament to do so, to invite President Zelensky to address uh, the European Parliament on the 2nd of March, after which I issued an invitation to 160 parliaments across the world uh, in order for what we heard to be heard in so many, what we say, new concepts of parliamentary diplomacy and parliamentary democracy. Why do I say this? Because I think following the 24th of February, we can never go back to the world before. There is a pre-24th of February and a post-24th of February world. And it is a date that we will remember as the one where public opinion told us that Europe is not only a conglomeration of countries that come together for economic reasons, but that remember that the European Union was founded on democracy, on values, on peace, on justice and on freedom. And when we have countries, you have just mentioned them, but especially Ukraine today that is fighting a war on Europe, that is fighting for exactly those same values, then we cannot look away and we cannot close the door. So upon being invited uh, by the president of the Verhofner Rada, it took me a couple of minutes for me to say that I will go. Uh, it was uh, uh, something that would then have to happen within hours because I was given the specific time. Uh, it was not an easy journey. And it was a time when Ukraine was still uh, under curfew and surrounded. It was also the day before the horrific images of Bucha surfaced on all our phones and all our computers. And you enter and you arrive in Kiev after a very, very long train journey. The city was deserted at the time on that day. There were no cars in the street. Over the nine, ten hours that I spent there, I met maybe two persons in the street. But then, this is the best part. I enter the Ukrainian parliament together with uh, my dear colleague Ruslan Stefanchuk and I find the beating heart of Ukrainian democracy. Hundreds of members of the Verhofner Rada, some of them are here today, uh, that were doing politics as we know it, you know, Tono, that we, you have different political groups, different agreements, resolutions, votes that were taking place, um, uh, political group meetings. And I said, this is amazing that this is a country at war, but that places democracy at its very heart of its actions. And I think that is a memory that will stay with me forever. Uh, when I arrived back home and I met uh, my husband, my husband who uh, um, I have met uh, I through the EPP and through the European Democrat students growing up, I said, I have grown up. I have now learned what actual politics is. And it's a memory that I will never forget. And I'm really, really, really uh, proud uh, of the courage and the bravery we saw there. Just a second. Hello, hello, please. I will ask all the delegates, especially those who are behind, uh, if you want to go to the bar, please do so. If not, please sit. 
Uh, we have exceptional now speakers uh, talking to us, and we are going to be soon joined. So I will ask you a little bit of respect. Thank you. It's my, it's, it's my task, it's my duty. <laughs> Wopke, how was, um, I was surprised, I was surprised in my country, Spain, which is very far away from Ukraine, the reception by the Spanish people, you know, about what was going on and the solidarity expressed. What was the reaction in the Netherlands? What did you felt those days, especially as Minister of Foreign Affairs? Well, thank you for that question. And may I start by thanking all of you for being here. It is for me, as a co-host, it is a tremendous honor, truly a tremendous honor to see so many friends here today with us in the room. Thank you very much for being here, particularly at such an important time for our political family, but also for Europe. And by the way, I very much liked to see what you were doing there uh, and, and asking everyone to be quiet. It reminded me a bit of how I try, often unsuccessfully, uh, to operate at, at a dinner table at home. Uh, but this is a new source of inspiration to me, so thank you for, for, for leading by example. And thank you, Roberta, for, for, for sharing that very personal and very uh, vivid uh, description of what you encountered in Ukraine. And, and if I may, um, I'll say something about my trip and then I'll come to your, 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 your question about solidarity, which I think is, is spot on. Uh, I very much agree with uh, what Roberta said about the tremendous impression it also made on me when I was with Kuleba, when I was with uh, Zelensky only a couple of weeks ago. On the one hand, of course, there, is the, there are the horrific things that have happened. And there, are, uh, there is the, 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 uh, the, the crimes of war, there is the devastation, there is uh, all the, the horrors that you, that you can imagine, that you hear about when you visit, like I did, uh, places like Irpin uh, and, and Butsha and the like. Uh, which is devastating and which should only encourage us as Christian Democrats to do more uh, to make sure that those responsible will be brought to justice. The second thing is that I was amazed, truly amazed by the tenacity and the willingness to continue this fight um, uh, in, in, in the hearts and minds of our Ukrainian friends. They stand up. They stand up, and I see a, a, a guest of honor coming to the stage. Um, they stand up not only for our stability and our freedom and, and, and our... I'll, I'll shut up for a minute and I'll, I'll let the Prime Minister arrive. And thank you very much for being here. Here we have Kyriakos Mitsotakis coming with us. Very good to see you. As I was saying, so they're, they're defending not only their own freedom, their own democracy, and their own stability, they are doing that for us as well. And I think that is precisely, uh, and that is why your question is so spot on, uh, why this triggers such a huge response, truly a huge response in terms of solidarity all across Europe, in Spain, as you rightfully mentioned, uh, in all the other countries, including the Netherlands. And you see that, that citizens and governments alike are willing to do their utmost in terms of helping out with weapons, in terms of helping out with humanitarian aid, but also in terms of very concrete things um, like uh, packaging stuff at school that they can then use and send to uh, Ukraine or, in, or, or do that in a neighborhood or do that through churches. You can see that in the willingness um, and the desire to harbor refugees themselves, uh, as many have done all across Europe. Uh, in, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, in Northern Europe, and in Southern Europe. And I think that is a huge sign of not only politicians and governments, but also our people showing what this conflict is all about. Thank you, Wopke. Uh, Kyriakos, you are an example of a leader that sometimes you have to take tough decisions, and it has been the case in council meetings with this new situation created by the invasion of Russia of Ukraine. How, we are talking today, I'm, uh, I'm telling you, not about policies, but about what were your sentiments when you heard about, for example, the invasion of Ukraine, and uh, how do you decide to take you know, action in Greece that has been so much also 
uh, welcomed by all the other European countries. Please. Well, um, Tono, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you. Uh, look, um, I still remember, you know, when the news broke that uh, Russia had actually uh, invaded Ukraine. Uh, the truth uh, was that uh, although we all had access to the relevant intelligence, not many of us thought that this would actually happen. Maybe it was uh, wishful thinking, or maybe we did not believe that uh, Putin would behave in such an irrational manner. But it didn't take much to realize how shocking it was to be faced with a war on our continent, something which was unthinkable. And uh, the founders uh, of, uh, of, of this party and the founders of the European Union fought so hard in order to ensure that territorial integrity in Europe would never be violated through the force of arms. So this is indeed uh, a new world we're facing. And as far as uh, Greece is, uh, is concerned, Although uh, we are a country which is um, relatively close to the Russian people because uh, of our geography and because of the tradition of our Orthodox Church, it was very, very obvious to me from the very beginning that we needed to take, uh, make the right uh, choice, and the right choice was to support uh, Ukraine in any way uh, possible. Uh, we took the decision to send uh, military uh, equipment. We explained why we did that, not just as a matter of principle, uh, to support a country that is under attack, but also to send a clear signal to anyone uh, who can uh, think that the borders can be redrawn through force, that they will be faced uh, with an overwhelming um, uh, response. And this is exactly what we've managed to do uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, Andre is, is, is here with us, and, and, and Roberta will still remember uh, the first uh, meetings in the council, you know, the first days we were still discussing as to whether we should sanction Putin himself. And then two days later, all the decisions were taken and now we've agreed the six package of sanctions, uh, which is the toughest measures we've ever um, uh, imposed upon, upon any country. And our strength here is, uh, is our unity. Uh, and uh, we have to explain to our people uh, why we're doing this. We have to explain to our people that yes, there will be short-term pain, uh, but uh, if we were not to stand up uh, to, to a bully, if we were not to support Ukraine, uh, you know, all the values we, we uh, have uh, built our political careers fighting for uh, would uh, es essentially be uh, threatened. So the um, decision at the end of the day, Tono, was obvious uh, and, uh, and easy. Thank you, Kyriakos. Uh, we have also now with us the Prime Minister of Croatia, Andrei Plenković. Warm welcome also. Andre, you come from a country that's uh, next also to, let's say, an uh, interesting area for us Europeans, which is the Balkans. How, do you lift, how did you leave the beginning of the invasion of Russia of Ukraine from that perspective, from that region of Europe? Thank you very much, uh, Tono. Sorry for being a little bit late, but you started a bit earlier. Uh, Kyriakos and myself, having been at the European Council, we're planning to be here at 6.30. And thanks to our hosts for organizing uh, the Congress of EPP. It's so nice to see you all again. Uh, I would like to, first of all, uh, greet our Ukrainian colleagues and friends and party, sister party members who are here to share with them a lot of solidarity and respect and support that we have all been having for Ukraine in this absolutely unbelievable context that has started on the 24th of February. Um, how did we feel? Uh, you know, there was a lot of cynicism at the beginning of this aggression, violating all the principles of international law and the international system that we all share. Uh, there was a comment that uh, wars in Europe do not start on Wednesdays. So apparently it was okay to start on Thursday the 24th. Uh, I immediately draw a parallel with the 2008 and the Beijing uh, Summer Olympic Games and the Olympic Truce and then Georgia. Now 2022 uh, Winter Olympic Games again in Beijing, again end of the Olympic Truce and aggression against Ukraine. Um, it is true that for the country who was uh, also a victim of aggression 30 and more years ago uh, of the regime of Slobodan Milosevic of Serbia, it was very 
quickly almost the reflex reaction by the Croatian authorities, Croatian government, and also Croatian people to stand with and stand by Ukraine and Ukrainians. Therefore, as a Prime Minister, when I learned what was happening at uh, early in the morning of the 24th, I immediately convened the government session. We immediately passed conclusions on support to Ukraine. Uh, then we all went to Brussels for the first European Council where President Zelensky addressed us. And I have to admire the courage and uh, the hardship that the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian military, Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian leadership have gone through over the last 100 days. They have demonstrated how one loves his own country. They have demonstrated how one fights for the freedom and the values. And I think we, uh, as the Union, but also as DPP, have been really consistent. And this is one of the values of our political family. We never had any doubt. We were hesitating. We knew who was right and who was wrong from the start. And I think we should remain as such in the course of our uh, taking of positions and concrete actions to support Ukraine. All of us were in Ukraine basically as leaders in the last couple of months. I was there even yep. before in December. And I think um, coming, coming from Croatia, uh, we understand very quickly what's going on and we know uh, how difficult it is. I will come back to Kyriakos because I was thinking your country has suffered aggression from Turkey several times. Uh, how have you dealt with that? I know, Greeks know, but it will be good for all of us to listen, you know, how with moderation but also with firmness you have reacted uh, to numerous provocations. The truth is, Tony, you don't choose your neighbors but uh, you're destined by geography to live with them. And it's, of course, much better to live uh, uh, in, in, in peace and uh, solve your differences uh, through the only commonly accepted framework, which is that of international law and good neighborly relations. This is what we've always tried to do. And this has always been my approach since I became a prime minister uh, with uh, President uh, Erdogan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that approach has not always been uh, reciprocal. Uh, we were faced, uh, uh, do you remember well, in uh, March 2020 with the first attempt to weaponize migrants on a systematic and on a large scale. We defended the European border. At the time, the leadership um, of um, uh, Europe, the President of the Council, the late President of the Parliament, uh, David Sassoli, uh, the President of the Commission, um, uh, stood uh, by us to send a signal that the borders of Europe have to be defended and that desperate people cannot be um, uh, weaponized in such a brazen uh, uh, manner. And since we've had uh, you know, good periods, now we're again faced with a period of, uh, uh, of, of tension. But uh, we will uh, do what we've always uh, done, uh, make our case uh, through rational uh, arguments, uh, make our case to our allies, and I would be, I'm very thankful for the support we've always received uh, at the European Council. We will probably will debate this uh, issue again uh, in uh, June, should the Turkish uh, aggression continue. Thank you for the support we've received, uh, uh, Roberta, uh, by the European Parliament. Uh, it means uh, a lot uh, to us uh, because what we cannot uh, tolerate uh, is uh, a new version of historical revisionism, uh, you know, fantasies of lost uh, uh, empires and a projection uh, of, uh, of, of power that is not in line uh, with uh, a rules-based international order. So I think this case that we uh, make um, um, uh, allows us to have lots of allies uh, in Europe, in the United uh, uh, States. Uh, the last thing we need today, Tono, is another source of instability uh, on NATO's southeastern flank. I'm sure maybe some people in, uh, in Russia uh, would be very happy if that were to happen, but uh, we're going to make sure we're not going to allow it. Uh, but we also send uh, a very clear signal that we will not compromise when it comes to uh, our sovereignty and our sovereign uh, rights. That is why, even before the Ukrainian crisis, uh, we spend more, as has Croatia, to strengthen our, uh, uh, our armed forces, uh, uh, to make sure that we have a credible deterrent capability. We are a force for peace. Um, we are a defensive power. But we want to send a very clear signal that uh, any notion 
uh, of threatening our sovereignty will be will, will be um, punished uh, uh, in a, in a very severe uh, manner. So. Uh, Complicated neighborhood, uh, Tono, to live in, uh, but uh, on, on the other hand, uh, very grateful to be facing these challenges as a member of the European family. Thank you. Thank you, Kyriakos. I, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid I'm going to have to, li to be a little bit rude now. People that are standing behind, please leave the room or sit. Please take your seats or go. Yes, please. We have, uh, we have two prime ministers here. We have the president of the European Parliament and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. At least we can show some respect. Okay. Thank you. It's part of the job description. Sorry for that. <laughs> Roberta, you come from the Mediterranean like me. Do you see any threats to our democracy coming? Uh, we have listened, spoken, we have spoken about the uh, Wagner Group in Africa, about the belt, Chinese belt, and the activities that are going down there. Do you see any kind of threat for us and our democracies building up or not? Thank you, Tono. So I'll, I'll split the question in two. First of all, do I see a threat to democracy? And this is an answer that we should all uh, 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 ask ourselves the question. Are we doing enough as politicians, as elected representatives, as people fighting for democracy in our countries and in our everyday job? in order to push back against the threat uh, of EU skepticism, of, of populism, of extremist rhetoric, but also of not tapping into enough with the frustration of some voters who feel far away from us. And I think that's a question that we should ask ourselves, especially today, when we emerge from a very difficult two years of a pandemic, where people have been at home, the whole generations of students have lost the possibility, um, as our host told us this morning, of going to school and living a life where discussions take place in person, but now everything has been for two years um, dealt with alone behind the screen, that it became so much easier to tap into or be uh, influenced by extremist rhetoric and narrative on our screens. What have we done as a Europe, and what can we do now as a party to push back against that growing? I think that that is an existential question that we should all, uh, whether our parties are in government or in opposition, fight against, especially in the run-up of the elections in 2024, which will be a test as to how we can encapsulate once again the hope and the vision for Europe in those generations that have not yet voted. As regards what is happening in our neighborhood, so I come from a country right and bang in the middle of the Mediterranean, very difficult neighborhood, big challenges traditionally, historical challenges, uh, violence, um, uh, autocracies, doing away with elections because it was convenient, corruption, politicians thinking they're above the law, that the rules don't apply to them. Uh, that has... Uh, not changed, it still continues to be a systemic problem in our neighborhood. What can we do about it? We are now not only facing a potential, uh, let's say, additional influx of migration because of economic instability uh, in a post-pandemic scenario, but now that we have an autocrat that has invaded another country, that has decided to break all sorts of rules that have been on paper for decades because of the reason why we wanted the European Union to be built, that is threatening famine and millions of people in the southern continents to feel in a position that they cannot pay for their food anymore. And this is because the supply chains are blocked, because there is no possibility 
of importation, that raw materials are not arriving, and that even for those countries that are in a position to grow their own food, they do not have the resources to do so. So what we are facing because of the decision of one autocrat is that you have millions of people whose livelihoods is, is threatened. What is our answer? Yesterday in the European Council uh, with, uh, with Kyriakos and Andre, uh, in, in, in the part where I was present, this was discussed. What do we do? Do we allow it once again to happen at the cost of so-called peace? Do we allow for face saving of a person um, because it is in our interest or in our comfort to look away? Or do we really today, as a political family, as a European Union, say this is unacceptable, no more? I would go for the latter. Because if Putin, if Putin did not stop in 2008, he did not stop in 2015, do you think he will stop now? No, he won't. Unless we answer in the strongest, most united, most coordinated fashion. I am proud of what we have done, of the leadership that uh, the European Union has shown, the European Commission has shown, uh, our Prime Ministers have shown in making sure that we are coordinated, effective and quick. That is, quick is not, a, let's say, a word or an adjective we usually use for the European Union uh, and also, least of all, my, the institution that I am a member of. But we managed, we managed because we had the political will and our citizens asked us to respond to an aggression that for my generation had not lived through it. Uh, and I would like to make sure that our children don't live through it and look at us and say, what did you do in 2022? Just like our children are already looking at us and saying, what did you do in 2015? So I would say that the threat is real, but our answers are, are in our hands because we have the tools to combat them. Thank you. Wolfke, are we facing a new Cold War? Is, uh, do we have to choose between the United States and China? I know my choice, but what is the role of Europe in all this? What is your vision about it? Well, thank you. And I think what, you, what, what your question shows, and also what Roberta just said, and with which I very much agree, shows us that there is a world before and after the invasion. And if you look at what is there on the wall, and I think we can all read it, we stand with you, we stand with Europe, we stand with Belarus, we stand with freedom, Ukraine and democracy. Friends, this is not just about Ukraine. And this war is the most extreme thing that we have seen recently from Russia. But let's also accept that we have been too naive in the decades that are behind us. We have thought that the peace dividend would always be there. We have been lured into a false sense of security. And I don't want to sound um, depressed about the world, but I do want to be realistic. We are in this for the long run. This conflict, this conflict, this war will take longer, but also the values, values like freedom, values like democracy, values like human rights, values that are inherently uh, belonging to us as an EPP, those values are not being taken for granted all across the world. And we have thought, we have thought that it would only be a matter of time until others outside of Europe would accept these as the best recipe for their citizens. But that is not the case. That is not the case. Other countries, first and foremost Russia, but Russia is not alone, are actively, actively challenging these values that in my view should be the centerpiece of the 21st century. And it is up to us in this specific war, but also beyond that, to defend and protect these values not only for our citizens in the European Union, but also for all those citizens across the globe who actually have the exact same rights to democracy, have the exact same rights to freedom, 
have the exact same rights to all those, those things that we, as European citizens, often take for granted. So we have to stand up, we have to live up to that promise and defend what is most dear to us. Thank you. Thank you, Wopke. Andrei, uh, you have come with Kyriakos and we're very grateful that you have come straight from the Council. Is there anything you can tell us from the Council? In terms of internal debate? Maybe something secret. <laughs> well, uh, I think that uh, the entire reflections and the de decisions that we have been taking do take place in a, in a global context which is critical for us as a party to understand. We are in the moment of rivalry between authoritarian regimes and democracies. We are at the moment with a different view on the concept of the way the world is governed. On the cooperative manner, the one that we are trying to advocate, and the conflictual ones that is happening right now. And in such a posture, what do we do as the European Union? What did we do as the European Council today? Uh, Roberta mentioned the speed. I think there are two tremendous uh, velocities that we should acknowledge in the context, in the post context of Russian aggression against Ukraine. One is the speed with which the European Union has reacted, or the speed with which Western democracies, as our panel says, have reacted. This has been unprecedented. And second is the overall international mobilization for Ukraine. Uh, I'm speaking this as someone who comes from a country who was also a victim of aggression, but in the beginning of the 90s, not that we didn't see such a mobilization of international community, we had to defend ourselves under the United Nations embargo and sanctions on import of arms. So what I see here is a tremendous aid to Ukraine. This was part of our debate, what you asked Tono, uh, yesterday and today, and there is a very strong commitment. There was an agreement on the package of sanctions, sixth package of sanctions in 100 days. This has been an incredible achievement. I think that the consequences for Russia will be felt because we can't accept that the war and the war campaign is financed by selling fuels, selling fossil fuels, selling oil, sell, selling gas, and thus profiting and being able to finance the military machine. And I think this unity of the European Council yet again has shown that here we can do a lot when we are committed, where we have a clear political will, clear guidance, and the overall historic responsibility. Because this is a moment when no one can afford to be silent, no one can afford to neglect what's going on. We should speak up, stand for our values, stand behind Ukraine and act accordingly. Whether it was political engagement, economic assistance, financial assistance, humanitarian support, military assistance or the overall special treatment that the Ukraine, in, Ukraine has now in its relationship with Europe. I don't recall anybody else who had had so many special, uh, dedicated programs, measures and support as Ukraine has had, has had over the past four months. Of course, it is due that is like that, and I think we should keep up this effort and continue. This is the message I would say was the most important from the European Council, including, of course, all the other issues, security, food, not to have a protracted crisis, for instance, in the Northern Africa or the Sub-Saharan Africa with a lack of uh, food that might happen, or the overall issue that uh, Kyriakos just mentioned, and that is strengthening our defense and military capabilities. We as the European Union, whether we are part of NATO, whether we should become part of NATO, should strengthen and pool our resources. And for instance, my country this year has the biggest defense budget ever, and we will continue in a sustainable manner to invest in our military capabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Uh... Energy, energy, energy. It seems that now our democracy is depending on energy. Do we have alternative sources? I know that something is going on in the south, in the Mediterranean, towards Greece, Israel, Cyprus, and others. What's going on, Kyriakos? 
Is there our alternative sources? We are faced with a, a short-term problem and a medium to long-term challenge. As Europe, we have been at the forefront uh, of uh, setting the pace for decarbonizing our economies. And uh, even before the Ukrainian um, uh, crisis, uh, uh, a big part uh, of our next generation EU package uh, was directed towards investments into making our economies uh, greener. Uh, and in the process, not just reduce our CO2 emissions, but also make our continent more energy independent. The second dimension was sometimes lost in the general debate about climate change. But after the Russian invasion in Ukraine, we understand how urgent it is to ensure our own energy independence. So now, uh, at the Council, we've tasked the Commission to finalize the, the detail of what we call the Repower EU plan, which is essentially repurposing the unallocated loans from the RRF and channel them again towards uh, projects that will make us more energy uh, independent and will pave our way towards reducing our emissions. In Greece, we are by nature uh, blessed with solar and wind energy. And we know that now the cheapest energy that we can produce in Europe is from wind and from the sun. That was not the case, uh, uh, unfortunately, when our energy uh, markets were designed. So coming back to the short-term um, challenge, Tono, all our governments, there's not a single colleague at the Council who is not struggling um, today with high energy prices. Uh, there's only that much we can do in terms of national uh, subsidies. That's why we've been advocating for European-wide solutions and to take a very close look at how the energy market itself is designed. The truth is we're paying very high prices for gas in Europe Tono, now, much higher than anybody else in the world. Uh, and this is a distortion that we need to address. We first of all need to recognize that it is a distortion and that it needs some sort of intervention. And we also link our electricity prices to the gas prices. Uh, so the marginal uh, unit which determines the price of electricity now is gas whereas in the past it was renewables. So the system is not properly designed to address these challenges. That's why it is very important. It's a technical discussion, Tono, um, and we also want the European Parliament on board in this discussion to really look at the design of our electricity market and to understand that right now we're the victims of a distortion. We're paying more money to Russia than we should. We're essentially contributing towards Russia making more money um, uh, uh, from, uh, from gas. And at the same time, we're imposing very high energy prices on our citizens. And my concern is that um, if we don't do this quickly, uh, uh, we, we risk, there's a risk here. And the risk is that the support in our societies will start to erode because people will look at their uh, you know, monthly uh, gas bills or their monthly electricity uh, bills uh, and uh, then uh, they will uh, realize that we're paying a higher price than we had anticipated. That is why on top of the national initiatives, we've taken quite a few in Greece to alleviate as uh, has Croatia. All countries are to a certain extent spending money um, uh, to, um, to subsidize in one way or another energy builds, it is imperative that we also need a short-term intervention. I have no doubt that uh, we will move towards um, making ourselves more independent. Um, uh, in Greece, for example, we are planning to construct an electricity cable that will connect Greece to Egypt and to Cyprus and to Israel. For example, from Egypt, we can import very cheap um, um, uh, electricity. Uh, so these are the types of projects that take time. But until these projects develop, let us not lose uh, sight uh, of, of the fact, uh, and I'm sure this is also an issue that is discussed at the European Parliament, that we need more urgent interventions to deal with the short-term problem of high uh, uh, energy um, uh, prices. This is uh, an urgent issue that needs to be addressed, not just at the national, but also at the European level. Roberta, do you think that we are ready in Europe from a defense point of view for the challenges that are happening in the world today? Should we do more? I think that the time has come after many years of, uh, again, looking away or perhaps uh, lack of willingness to do things together for uh, a proper defense, a union. 
Keeping in mind uh, certain specificities of uh, number of member states in terms of neutrality, etc., et but we have seen over the past uh, weeks and months the pooling in of resources that we never thought possible or we never wanted to think possible. And I think this is also something that we should look back uh, over the past years in the way we handled uh, the pandemic, where we realized that more Europe was suddenly a good thing. We spent years saying, no, no, you know, let's, let's leave it at member state level, let's, uh, this is a federalistic thing. But during the pandemic, the day after, when we realized that the instinct was to close borders, the instinct was uh, to look inwards and blame the externalities, until we realized that without each other, we could not have vaccines for everyone. We, could, we needed to rely on each other for medical equipment, a medical attention. And today we're in a position to say we are ready to create a proper European health union. So I think we are in a very crucial moment. We're in the context of talking about the conference on the future of Europe and we can, we can discuss uh, uh, at length about uh, whether we open the treaty or not, position of the parliament is very clear in, in that we want to have a convention, but we also need to see what tools we already have. Uh, when we see the EPF, how it has been used, how it has been well used, uh, when we thought that we would not be able to use it in the current structure, when we see the way that uh, member states have answered so quickly to President Zelensky and his colleagues' requests, then we see that defense-wise we have the capacity to act and with speed. But also, Kyriakos, we have had this conversation in, earlier about what we mean by our external borders and the possibility to actually strengthen those external borders through the agency we have, which is a, a union response to a question that has been pushed by, by uh, our political family for many years, because we have also not to forget that after the March 2020 incident at the external borders, which, which got a strong response and once again called for the securitization uh, through defense means of those borders, we had the hybrid attack by Belarus on our ba Baltic uh, countries and on Poland. This is only a few months ago. Time goes so fast, and let me make it very clear, uh, this is no time to try, as Putin would want, for us to look away from Belarus, because that is a country that has been fighting an autocracy and a dictator for decades. And that is exactly what Putin would want us to do, to look away. So my uh, answer would be yes, absolutely. We are not uh, well equipped, we need to be more. We need to have a true and proper defense union. We should not be afraid to see where the gaps are and be ready to fill them with solutions at the European level. But now I will flip the argument over. We have had many uh, solutions at our fingertips. We have had tools in our hands that we could have used with majority voting, etc., but we didn't when the word solidarity was not used, when it could have been used with countries that needed it. And I think we should also look a little bit internally over what happened over the past 10, 15 years, that it is sometimes not only about inventing or creating new tools, but about how we use those that we already have. And I'd like to mention one uh, uh, anecdote which I, I, I wanted to, 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 to bring back earlier. We, we are a party that has always focused very much on the regions. And I'm sorry, I'm seeing Apostolos in front of me. Uh, and I need to, to recognize, and we need to recognize, uh, as a, a pro-European party and, call, and group of parties, that without our activity at the regional level, what we have seen in Europe would not have happened. Would not have happened. And I, I see this because we have so many mayors also among you, so many colleagues that are active on the local level that to open their homes, that organized the possibility of hundreds of thousands of refugees, of Ukrainians traveling. That was one experience I will never forget as I was boarding 
the train to Kiev, that there was a group uh, of, of refugees boarding a train to Prague on the same platform on the other side. And I saw it happening with my own eyes and I said, this is Europe in action. So we have the tools, we can do more, we have shown our human side, I think now we also need to show our defense potential. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, good news. Tomorrow we will vote an amendment that will give our committee of the regions, all our regions and cities, more representation in this Congress. Thanks to Apostolos and Oliert. Uh, So, mission accomplished. Huh? So, uh, Roberta and I, we are a little bit like in the parliament side. Let's go to the council side. About defense. Do you agree with Roberta? Do you think that we have to do more? Are we on the right path? The special situation with NATO. I'm a fan of NATO. Huh? I'm sure that all of you <laughs> also. But uh, how do you see defense? for the next 10 years, which is a crucial now uh, question for all of us. Now, no particular order, if anyone wants to react. Huh? Because next well, question will a, be, Greece sorry, next question will be uh, if Ukraine is going to be a member of the European Union, so I will throw it also, uh, if anyone wants to take it. Huh? Okay, sorry. I, I think we need, to, we need to spend more, and we need to do it in a smarter way. Uh, that's. Uh, I think that's something we, we, we all agree on, and uh, even countries which were way under the 2% uh, threshold, uh, um, your Prime Minister has, uh, has, has committed, he just told us that you've made a big announcement in terms of pushing your military budget, uh, so there's no doubt that we need to, we need to spend more, uh, and of course uh, we need to do it in a way that is fiscally sustainable. Uh, we will have the discussion regarding the new parameters of the Growth and Stability Pact, and I know that there are many of us thinking about various exceptions to what should count or should not count um, uh, towards our, uh, our deficits. But I think if, if there's one category of spending that, especially after Ukraine, needs to be in a completely separate category, it is the most existential role that the state has to play, which is to defend its citizens. So I would very much advocate for us thinking constructively about how to treat defense spending. But spending at the national level is clearly not enough. We've always uh, see these presentations of the number, the multiplicity of weapon systems that we have in, in Europe. So there's no doubt in my mind that we need more joint procurement and, and more streamlining when it, when it comes to purchasing weapon systems. We need to buy more European. The truth is that 60% uh, of the spending um, is currently non-European. Um, spending, which, we needs, which means we need competitive systems, which means we probably need more scale, we probably need more consolidation. Uh, and uh, if we do that in a joint manner, then interoperability becomes a much easier question to answer. Let me give you a joint example between us and Croatia. We both bought the same type of aircraft. We both decided to buy French Rafale jets. So what did we do? We bought European, uh, and we bought the similar type. Maybe had we thought it before, we could have even done some sort of uh, you know, joint procurement um, initiative. We never know it'll come. But this, but this is so much easier in terms of servicing, in terms of making sure that our forces, also within NATO, uh, are more streamlined and are much interoperable. Last observation, this is not competing with NATO. The stronger the European component is within NATO, the more leverage we will have uh, within NATO, but the more capabilities we will have, should we choose at the European level at some point to act on our own, to be able to um, undertake uh, that, that uh, task without always relying uh, on uh, transatlantic support. Thank you. And I, I couldn't agree more. And maybe, uh, I don't know, I could share one of my experiences of uh, the last couple of months. As is always the case in politics and in Europe, there is never a shortage of meetings. And uh, I had a range of meetings with my NATO colleagues uh, as, as well as with my European colleagues. And the interesting thing is 
that already, if you look at the member states, there is, of course, huge overlap. But in the last a couple of months, also something else became possible, and that very much links to what Roberta was saying uh, before. What was impossible only a couple of months ago is now completely acceptable to everyone. Because in these NATO meetings, some of our European friends were present most of the time. Um, and, then, and then our uh, EU meetings, there was the Secretary, Secretary General of NATO and our Canadian and American friends were present there as well. And the big task that we have in front of us is making sure that Europe truly stands on two legs, on NATO and on the EU for geopolitics. And of course, defense is primarily the objective of NATO. It is the cornerstone for, for many of the European countries. But if you think about the future, and you think about the geopolitical position of the European Union, there is a lot of work that we have to do. We are an economic superpower, and we have to make sure we translate that capability into geopolitical savviness. And we haven't done enough, and there's much more that we can do. And let me close on by saying that I would very much welcome, I think as we would all do, our two friends that are already part of the European Union, Finland and Sweden, in NATO as well, because it would further, uh, it would further show how seamlessly these two organizations can, will, and should work together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. if, if I may just add a few points, and uh, the key one is uh, already something I said in the previous intervention, that our defense spending in this year is highest ever. And it's also due to the fact that uh, we, as Kyriakos mentioned, just like Greece, decided to buy the European technology that are foul multi-combat planes of the latest generation that France actually has at the moment, and we shall be enhancing thus our uh, capabilities to the extent that our uh, military has never had before. But what I think is, is critical is to mention the strategic autonomy. Uh, we are facing challenges in terms of energy, but we are fully aware that it's not any more affordable to go along the road of sort of silent European disarmament. This was mentioned in the debate today during the debate on security and defense um, at the European Council. And I think everybody has been aware of this. Uh, we can't uh, be sleepwalkers if someone else is discreetly very active. That means that we need to strengthen our cap capabilities, combine the investments which we do at a national level with the various European funds that we have created for such a purpose. And also invest in our technological and industry base, not forgetting the small and medium-sized enterprises, especially the industry in the smaller member states, because we clearly differ here. The big countries, they have a very large, gigantic, compared to some of us, uh, their defense industry, but I think we should strike the right balance in this respect. And also, uh, as Vopka mentioned, this NATO-EU interaction. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I was uh, living and working in Brussels, there was always a comment, do they actually ever meet the two organizations? As if uh, uh, Plus Schumann and Zaventem are so far away from each other. And they are not, and they should not be. And therefore, this uh, compatibility and complementarity of the two organizations has really been clear in the last couple of months more than ever before. And therefore, I think there is a, a very clear consensus. We shall all be strengthening our defense capabilities individually, jointly pooling resources and making better use of what we actually spend for defense. Croatia is now above 2% of our uh, GDP in terms of defense spending, and out of this 2%, more than 30% are allocated for modernization. This uh, is uh, the right answer in the right time. Thank you, Andre. And now comes a tricky question. Ukraine, Moldova, do you see them? as future members of the European Union? No deadlines, no deadlines. Future members of the European Union. We, we will have this debate in a month. And uh, I can tell you, it is not going to be 
an easy one because we already sense that uh, there are diverging uh, views within the council. I will just one, make one point. First of all, pointing out that we are still, we're expecting the AVI, the, the, um, the opinion of the, uh, uh, of the Commission. But if indeed there is a world before and a world after the 24th of February, that needs to be taken into consideration in our um, uh, thinking and in terms of how open uh, we want to be to extend candidate statute um, to these countries. On the other hand, we should not forget about the Western Balkans. This is a topic that is uh, very close to, um, to, our, um, uh, to our heart. Uh, we need to make sure that we do not send a signal that uh, the, the order uh, of procession is uh, significantly derailed. And the first priority we have there is to make sure that we resolve the outstanding issue between uh, Bulgaria and North Macedonia so that we can start um, proper negotiations between North Macedonia uh, and uh, Albania. So I think uh, we need to recognize the singularity of what happened uh, and the desperation uh, of, uh, of Ukraine and the need for them to be anchored uh, within the European architecture while not forgetting also about the fact that there are other countries uh, in the process that are also eagerly uh, awaiting to make their own progress based on their own merit. Okay. When I was in Kyiv in December, I signed a bilateral declaration with President Zelensky supporting Ukraine's European path. And as the latest uh, member of the European Union in terms of stage in the organization, having joined only on the 1st of July 2013, we would be the last country to say no to anyone. So our policy in general is to support, first of all, our neighbors in Southeast Europe in their attempts to fulfill the criteria and become members of the European Union. And I'm happy that Kyriakos has mentioned the Balkans. I mention here in particular two countries which have not yet been granted a candidate status. One is Bosnia and Herzegovina and the other is Kosovo. Kosovo is not recognized by five member states of the European Union and that poses a, a serious obstacle. But Bosnia and Herzegovina certain, certainly should not be the last wagon in the train towards the European Union. And in this respect, uh, I think that we should, as the EPP, try to fine-tune some of the elements which are standing on this way, not only the 14 conditions that the Commission has outlined towards Bosnia and Herzegovina a couple of years ago, but also to settle the basics. And the basics are m major and elementary democratic rights of fair electoral system, of constitutional reform, and thus enable that all the three constituent peoples, the Bosniaks, the Croats, the Serbs, as well as all the others, feel well and comfortable in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And therefore, I appreciate the efforts after the European Council conclusions in March that the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, has undertaken in direct talks with the highest level of political leaders in Bosnia and Herzegovina to come to a consensus to alter the um, electoral law, which is, in our view, inadequate because it doesn't end up with legitimate representatives in the institutions. And we shall continue to insist on this issue because we feel it is essential. On Ukraine, on Moldova, on Georgia, all three countries have applied for membership. Uh, we are waiting for the Commission's avis. The process is always the same. The country applies. The Council sends the dossier to the Commission. Commission, uh, before writing the avis, sends the series of questions to the, can to the country that is aspiring to become a member. And then the answers come and are evaluated. So I think it will be very important what the European Commission will say uh, on this uh, membership application demands. Um, it's an early stage of internal debate, but I sense it's not going to be easy. Uh, this is a far-fetching uh, decision-making process. Uh, some of the member states do look differently at the enlargement in general. Some of them look differently in different parts of Europe. Some of them uh, look differently in the future concepts of how we should organize the European Union and its neighborhood. So I'm sure we are facing a, a very exciting 
and I would say uncertain debate of what will be the final decision. These are decisions taken by consensus, and that means that everybody has to be on board. So with all, uh, I would say, allegiance towards the uh, legitimate ambition, especially of Ukraine in this context, because I do understand the symbolical value of being granted a candidate status in the context that Ukraine finds itself now. The leadership expectations, but moreover, the expectations of the people, and also the peoples of Georgia and Moldova, who are also concerned on what will be their future. So we will have to find a very intelligent, and I would say hopefully as broad in terms of consensus decision in several weeks' time. Maybe they will listen more to you, Ruth. Thank you. Oh. And Tono, you, you were asking about uh, the very long term, uh, but I think it also reflects reality that my, my two colleagues here talk about the short run, uh, because we really did enter a completely new phase in, in European history. Now, on the long run, and, and talking about Europe more in general, I think one of the most attractive things of our union, truly one of the most attractive things, is uh, the fact that we are, by nature, inclusive and that means that any country that is on European soil and it is both willing and able willing and able um, is um, uh, is allowed to apply and is uh, and is considered part of Europe and part of Europe's future and then of course there is this this uh, short-term uh, issue and I think the reality is that it is very difficult for anyone who has talked to Zelensky or to my colleague Kuleba and who knows that this country is literally fighting for its life to say no to anything. And that also is a reason Let's see whether that works. People behind, could you please shut up and go for once and at all, please. Thank you. Thank you. So a friend in need, it is very difficult to say no to. And that is precisely the reason why so many of us uh, from the EPP family, from all our uh, member states, have gone to great length, have done the unthinkable uh, in providing Ukraine with weapons, in putting up very, very significant sanction packages, in helping out with harboring refugees, in helping out with humanitarian aid, and taking the very first steps in making sure that those responsible for war crimes are being put to justice. That is all that is needed. Uh, but at the same time, there is, of course, also this issue. Um, and I think that what, what we have done so far is actually a wise step. Uh, as my two, two colleagues have said, the Commission is now looking into this matter very seriously, is taking into account all the various positions in the capitals, but also the geopolitical reality that we are facing, and that simply has changed. And I think it is up to us as leaders, as members of the EPP family, but also as foreign ministers and prime ministers, to whatever the commission comes up with, uh, take an open look at that, uh, and then come to a quick and firm decision. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Roberta was here writing a lot of ideas, so, <laughs> Roberta. I'm not sure I'm going to read out what I wrote on the paper, but uh, I very much look forward to the next European Council. Uh, it is going to be uh, a difficult one. Uh, enlargement discussions are never easy. Uh, we can, of course, and we will, uh, as a parliament, uh, do our part uh, after the Commission AV is published. But I will start from the principle, uh, from experience of being one of ten countries that was waiting for that crucial moment when the door was opened. 
And I'll never forget that feeling of welcome, that feeling of belonging after decades of struggle uh, against uh, whether it was lies, misinformation at the time, etc. Uh, and when we celebrated uh, our uh, entry into the European Union 18 years ago, a couple of weeks, uh, a couple, uh, one month ago, and in 2024 we will be celebrating our 20th uh, anniversary of joining together with those nine other countries, it will be a moment where we can look back and say, was that the greatest decision or not? And I can tell you resoundingly that whoever you will meet in those 10 countries, they will tell you, hell yes, hell yes. Now, we are living, of course, in a specific situation where we have countries that have already applied. Uh, some of them have shown their wish decades ago. Some countries who uh, uh, would like or have expressed a wish uh, for them, we would also insist that the sanctions packages are implemented correctly and no gaps are left. But also that there is a population and there are countries that would like that door to remain open and that hope to be kept alive because they are literally fighting for their lives for it. Uh, and if we can manage uh, at the next uh, European Council, Andre used the word intelligent, uh, I agree fully with those words that can continue to show that when we look at the European Union, it is not only economic decisions that define uh, the territory or the external borders, but the fundamental principles which we all share, which our political family is, is founded on. I am convinced of this. The European Parliament has been already uh, very clear with the largest majority uh, we have ever seen, and this is not easy to get majorities all the way, uh, from uh, the left to the right, with a resounding, if a country looks to Europe for protection, for peace, for liberty, for justice, let's not look away, let's not close that door. Thank you, Roberta. And then a final question to all of you. This Congress is the starting point of the efforts of this party to confront the elections, European elections in 2024. In the meantime, there will be elections in some of our countries, but this political family has, will start as from tomorrow to focus on those European elections 2024. I would like to grab the opportunity that we have the privilege of these four speakers to ask them how they will, how they think we should address these elections, what would be the messages that we should give in 2024. I know it's still a long time, I know it is, but what is your sensation after all we are living? Uh, Roberta, you spoke last. I will give now a little bit of breath. Andrei. Well, time is passing very fast, and um, it's already three years past the last European elections, and the next ones are in two years. What we have witnessed across uh, the member states of the European Union, especially in the Western part of Europe, we have seen that the EPP parties, members of our family, have been bitten from everywhere. If we are too politically correct, then we are labeled as being too centrish or leftish. If we are too conservative, we are attacked as backwards. This is a, a very difficult political situation for the European People's Party, the biggest European family in Europe. And I think our focus in the preparation of these elections should be exactly to avoid such scenarios. To demonstrate that we are the most reliable, the most serious, 
the most organized and the most problem-solving oriented political family and the party organization. Be because the times that we are living in are so challenging, so demanding, the new crises appear one after another, not literally that there is a pause between them, but they sort of blend with each other. For that, you can't trust the demagogical, I wouldn't even call them populist political parties. You can't trust those who are at the far pieces of the political spectrum in any of our countries because they don't have the inclusive solutions. We do. And therefore, I think the fight is for every each party of ours in its own country to demonstrate the values, the political ambitions, and the programs that we stand for, partly included in the program we shall be adopting and the declaration we shall be adopting tomorrow, but being prepared really to demonstrate again why the EPP has been the party that was predominantly constructing Europe. And therefore, this is our biggest challenge in the next uh, two years, challenge of the tomorrow elected leadership of the EPP, and we are willing from our side to provide more than an active contribution as we have been doing over the past years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrei. Wopke. Tono, you are asking for 2024, but I'm sure you know the saying that a week is a long time in politics. Uh, so it is not necessarily easy to give a decent answer to your question. Uh, but, I, but if I have to take a shot, my 50 cents of wisdom would probably be along the following lines. For us, the main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. There are huge differences between our countries, between our parties, but there is one very important basket of things that unites us, that keeps us together. And that is the values that we share. Those are the values that should not be upheld in some of the countries, for some of the people, some of the time, but for all of our people in all of our countries, all of the time. And that is about human rights. That is about democracy. That is about standing up for freedom. That is about each and every of these values that the founders of the EPP have stood up for in the past. And I think if there's one unifying the theme, then it's that theme that we should pursue. And frankly speaking, we, have, we, we are allowed and we should actually be much, much more vocal about it. Thank you. Kyriakos. Before thinking about the 2024 elections, I first have to win my re-election in Greece in 2023. It's one of the important elections that will, that will come up in the electoral calendar, including um, you know, Spain, um, um, Poland. Uh, it is an opportunity before the 2024 uh, elections to make sure that we increase our presence uh, at the European Council because the last electoral cycle has not been uh, uh, very kind to us. And my personal experience uh, in Greece is very much aligned with, Andre, with what Andre said. At the end of the day, our job is to solve problems. Uh, and I would encourage us uh, while preserving the fundamental values of our party, Bobke spoke very eloquently about them, to also focus on the practical concerns of people today. And these are jobs, growth, health, education, and income inequality. We need to reach out to all of those who are disgruntled and uh, convince them that the populists offer very easy and uh, 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 sort of uh, palatable solutions, but when they are elected into power, usually they make a huge mess out of it. This was very much the Greek experience, and I hope it will not be repeated in many other European countries. So a combination of focusing on our traditional values, what has made our European family so strong and so important in the history of the European Union, with a focus on cutting-edge problem-solving and uh, really innovatively public uh, uh, policy solutions, embracing the green transition, embracing digital, which is such a transformative um, tool in order to rebuild trust between governments and our citizens. These are some of the uh, lessons that we need to take forward uh, as we move into the 24 uh, electoral cycle. Thank you very much, Kyriakos. 
Roberta, you and I, we have faced uh, four European elections. What is your message? What are you expecting of the next ones? Well, we are the ones who, uh, in my case, I will be a candidate in 2024, so I'll, uh, for the European elections, and it will be a very, very uh, difficult one, but one that I think we can look back uh, as having had a mandate which focused on what mattered. Uh, sometimes I feel that we run elections with buzzwords that are, we don't even bother to translate. Big words, and then we question ourselves, but why didn't people vote for us? What happened? And I think that for a while we were almost afraid of not saying we were pro-European and that we should be proud to be European and run a pro-European campaign. And by saying that we are pro-European means that we are addressing um, jobs, job inequalities. We are going to be addressing, we haven't mentioned mental health, a big, big, big uh, consequence of the pandemic. We are going to have an audience of 88 million 15 to 29 year olds who should be able to look at our political family as the one giving them the answers, as the one that is ambitious on climate, as the one that does not treat the environment and climate as though they were mutually exclusive. We've done that before. As one that we can look to Europe to create new jobs and solve problems. And ultimately, I think if we go into these elections with one message, that we can win. And I am convinced that we can win. And I'm convinced that the next European Parliament will be composed of an even larger European Party, People's Party Group membership in it. Well, thank you very much to the four of you. I have been abusing your time. Uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you for sharing with us here in our confidential meeting of the EPP. And uh, hope to see, listen to you soon. Four of us, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Thank you.